Welcome back to our Succession podcast. I'm Jenny, I'm here with Savannah, and this week we're talking about the sixth episode of season four, Living Plus. I totally thought this was going to be an app when I saw the episode title. Yeah, I don't know what I expected this to be. Definitely uh, not what I anticipated from the little preview. And I definitely want to start this conversation by just talking about Living Plus as a concept, what it brings to the table for the themes of the show, because it's definitely very relevant as far as uh, the themes of like mortality and the physical limitations of you know, having a body and how that kind of levels the playing field for even the rich and powerful, but also just Living Plus as an actual business venture, which I think is one of the most like horrifyingly dystopian things that Waystar has ever attempted. It's one of the worst things we've ever heard on this show. Like there's sometimes headlines about not even Waystar specific things, but just things happening in this world. Living Plus is the worst so far. So the actual idea behind like Living Plus, so it's basically a retirement community, and even the people that are sort of uh, in favor of it, like Kendall and Shiv, describe it in very chilling terms. So Kendall says that it's warehousing the elderly and keeping them drunk on content, and Shiv later refers to it as prison camps for granny. And these are the people that are uh, trying to make this thing happen. So I think the parts of it that are really scary or just the fact that it's really like a surveillance state that oh it's really secure because we're always we're always watching you're perfectly safe here don't even worry and just the fact that there's these tie-ins with like atn and we're gonna have the news going all the time and uh we're gonna bring in all these content tie-ins and all of our ip from our movie studio it's really just horrifying yeah every single thing they said about it just I can see the selling point for the investors, but it is horrifying to listen to. I love when they said that they are going to quote unquote repackage the health data of the residents at some point for increased profit. Just repackage it, you know. Great way to say data harvesting there. (laughs) It's really just this attempt to sort of vertically integrate a person's entire life cycle, you know? Like we're gonna do all of your entertainment, all of your health-related stuff, where you live, all of it being under one company. Ah. (laughs) I mean, that's never gone wrong before. Yeah, I think that most people just in general probably have or will soon have some kind of close personal experience with like navigating the system of assisted living. And so my parents aren't at that age yet, but my sister lives in a group home because she has some disabilities. uh, And I work at that group home as my part-time like weekend job. I have the world's worst nepotism job where I work 48 hour shifts and have to clean up bodily fluids. It's great. Love it. But yeah, so I have a lot of experience with the sort of care like industry, both as a family member, as like a guardian of someone that's in that system and also as an employee of that system. And where I work and where my sister lives is a nonprofit, which I feel a lot better about. There are for-profit companies that uh, do like group home care for disabled people. And I just like fundamentally disagree with that and think think it's unethical. Uh, But, you know, it's just a really, it's a really dark system. And I think the part of Kendall's pitch that was really interesting was that he never once mentioned like the human caretakers involved in this. You know, if it's an assisted living kind of like retirement community, are there caretakers there? Are there human employees? Or is it all this just kind of electronic monitoring of the residents? So that like human element is the most essential part of that, but yet a part that is kind of a scarce resource, especially right now. I mean, that's kind of why I got this job is because they really needed workers. And I, you know, I want my sister to be able to live there. So I started working there. Um, So yeah, it's like, just yikes, a bit, a big yikes from me all around on this one. Yeah, I've never worked in assisted living, but just from the stories you've told me, I know it's very important having a physical person there. Ideally, there would be more than one person there at all times. Um, You really do need a human touch with this sort of thing. And I think something that really horrified me about his pitch was not only did he not mention, you know, any workers that would be there, but he didn't actually address who would be living there. Like he never said, oh, this is for the elderly or the disabled. He was just talking about tech. It's, you know who this is for. 
Right. He said you were your parents and obviously like the promotional images showed that it was more for like elderly people and, 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 you know, maybe before they have a lot of needs and they just need somewhere to live that's a little cheaper once they've retired or something like that. Um, and obviously you can share the cost of real estate when you're selling all of your personal data. There's already so much health data that does get sold. Like, I feel like elements of this exist already. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think it's just like the packaging of all of it together with the news and the content. I think it was Logan that said in his little promo that said something about like integrated everyday character IP life enhancements. What? Doderick. Doderick? It made me think a little of Celebration in Florida, the little neighborhood that's like yeah. Disney World. You're living the fantasy life all the time. And I remember it was like a news story the first time there was a murder there because they're like, oh, it's a safe community. There won't be crime here. Yeah, that's a good comparison. I was kind of thinking about that too. Just the idea of of a company that's like an entertainment company expanding into a larger role in your life is sort of a dystopian nightmare. It, it really is. And it has huge appeal for people. You can live the fantasy world all the time. You'll be perfectly safe here. Yeah, we heard that one before in every dystopian work of fiction ever. Love that. Yeah, a couple of the quotes from this pitch. I mean, our incredible links with tech and pharmaceutical companies, which mean privileged access to life enhancement and extension therapies that right now are the preserve of tech billionaires, but we're going to deliver them at home, at scale, targeted and supported. When he said our links with tech and pharmaceutical companies, I was like, oh, great, evil and evil. (laughs) Our good friends. Can't think of two industries I'd rather be more involved with than tech and pharmaceutical companies. They've got their finger on all the industries and relationships with everyone. It's just, I mean, I think we don't always see it, just how involved in everything they are. And it was good in this episode to get more of a glimpse of what they actually do outside of, you know, the ATM stuff. Yeah, we really got an image of just what it means to be a huge conglomerate like this, that they have fingers in all the pies. More on a thematic level, I mean, it it really works. I mean, you know, Succession has always been interested in questions of mortality and and obviously with Logan dying um, towards the beginning of this season, that's kind of come back to the forefront here and um, using um, the sort of audio and video like editing of Logan you know, whether or not that's like technically like a deep fake, it definitely kind of evoked that idea of that you can use this uh, pre-recorded footage of of people to make them say whatever you want them to say. And, and using that both in a personal way, obviously, with these characters, when it's their father, but also using it to, uh, you know, convince a room full of investors that your new idea is great. Well, you might as well market the guy's death. They're like, hey, this actually works really well. And as a story decision, it does work really well. I remember when Logan died, there were a lot of things, um, you know, on podcasts and such with people saying how this episode showed that being rich exempts them from a lot. They had had no consequences for anything. But as much as Kendall was trying to control the situation and they were trying to do what they could, they don't have any control in a situation like this. Um, And then this episode, we saw them really grappling with that and trying to say, hey, well, maybe we can. Maybe there is a way we could eventually stop death, right, guys? Uh, We have that power. Yeah, that's like the one thing that you can't get out of with your wealth and power is just you're still a human and every person ever has died. You can avoid it for longer, for sure, Uh, but you can't actually get out of it. I was really glad to see Brian Cox again. Just, I think, opening with him was a great decision, and especially waiting a couple episodes, too, before bringing him back. Otherwise, it would have felt like a bit much. Nice to see your familiar, awful face. It was fun to see them keeping him alive in this way and able to control him in a way that they have never been before. Yeah, they could literally make him say what they wanted him to say. Yeah, they can frame Logan for things instead of Logan always trying to frame other people for things. I was... Totally surprised to see him again. I think I had kind of given up on that at this point. He was actually on set for a real reason. He had said in interviews that he had filmed extra scenes, but I think that the 
directors and and people that were trying to keep secrets more were like oh they were like dummy scenes to throw people off the scent now we know at least one of them was not a dummy scene and they don't do flashbacks so i'm curious to see what other scenes we might get from him lying in a casket possibly (laughs) i'm gonna be disappointed if we don't get that also one of the thoughts i had pretty uh quickly was like well he can't submit as guest in the emmys now Because you you have to be in three or fewer episodes to submit as guests. So he will definitely be submitting, I think, in the supporting category. So good thing that Kieran got out of there and went to lead. Yes, very good thing. We could maybe get a father, son, and daughter, possibly, Emmy sweep. That would be the, the ideal. It would be on brand for them to leave out Kendall and Connor. The end of this cold open, to do a mild criticism, in the video when Logan says stop buzzing around me you're just like my fucking idiot children that was a little on the nose for me I could have done with something a little more subtle than that yeah it was not the most subtle line of course the one video they had left to Logan he very directly insults them I know I was like okay I see what we're doing here (laughs) from that I was like oh boy strap in for this one but I ended up liking what they did with the video by Uh, the end of it, so I was okay with it overall, but that was kind of a clumsy moment for me, just right at the beginning. So in this episode, Kendall plans to kind of uh, try and price out Matson by pitching the hell out of Living Plus. And, you know, this is a plan that in the end seems to work, but at the beginning of this, there's definitely some conflict between the siblings Shiv calls them out on lying to her and keeping her out of their plan to try to tank the deal. And they made a fairly unconvincing show of trying to kind of dissuade everyone. It was bad. <laughs> I wanted to see the scene of them like deciding what they were going to say because yeah. they, need, they need a lying coach. They could have used Shiv on that one. They could have done way better than, oh, yeah, it seemed like you didn't really want the deal and was like negotiating hard, like, Okay. And when they were asked what he said, it seemed like they hadn't thought about it. They it's didn't like, prepare for any questions have you, whatsoever. Is this your first lie ever? She would have done better, and this was very insulting to her. I will admit that I did not think the Roy sibling bond was going to fall apart this quickly. They're all just very openly lying to each other. Looking a little rocky here and gets rockier throughout this episode, clearly with Roman feeling very left out at the end but this beginning with Shiv is very sad because um I think Roman feels bad but also was the one that was kind of sticking to the lie a lot more than Kendall was kind of willing to say yeah yeah that's what we were doing I mean they weren't selling it I think they had to cop throughout this episode this seems poised to just be a classic disaster for Kendall right I don't think anyone was expecting it to go well including everyone in the universe and also, you know, watching it at home and in the audience. The promo too really set up the expectations for another Kendall disaster episode. And I will admit I was feeling a little bit of dread just cause we've seen it so many times at this point. Um, so this was a really nice surprise that it actually went well. I felt bad for Roman. <laughs> He's very much a middle child that is very obvious this season. The way he is very much in the middle of Shiv and Kendall, and Kendall keeps going to him like, hey, let's cut Shiv out, and he's like, okay. Shiv is now going to Roman like, hey, how about you uh, get out of this Kendall thing? He's acting crazy. They're, they all know he's the most malleable of the siblings and are really turning to him at this time. He's very easily swayed by what anyone says to him. Yeah. And we got to see him by himself a little bit in this episode too, which I think makes it clearer at least what he's thinking. And that was also a fucking disaster, even worse than when he was just swayed by whatever his siblings were telling him to do. Uh, So yeah, rough one for Roman. Roman Nation is in shambles. (laughs) I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I still love him. I support him through it all. But whoa, man, (laughs) rough Roman episode. I've never felt like Roman had a threatening aura in a scene until this episode. Like, it was genuinely a little scary. Absolutely. Maybe we should just kind of skip to talking about Roman now since we're doing it. But Roman has never been at all intimidating, has never even sounded really angry in a way that's like a little scary until this episode. More so with the Jerry scene. He can access that. Yeah, he's definitely full of a lot of anger right now. So Roman... um. (laughs) 
Feminist women love Roman Roy. Fired two women in one two episode. Two very high-ranking women in the world, you know, mostly dominated by men. Two high-ranking women. He's just taking them out. He's not beating the mommy issues allegations. Uh, the scene with joy who is um studio executive the way that this like spirals and what is the trigger for him i think is something we could talk about he at least feels questioned that like oh like you don't think that i'm worthy of this you don't think i'm like my dad and then also she uh, mentioned some concerns about atn and that hollywood talent doesn't want to be attached uh to the studio anymore we're kind of stringing this like atn plot along this is another little brick in the wall and um yeah we know that roman um is like pretty keyed into that he says like oh yeah i mean i don't like mankin no one likes mankin i'm like you 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 like mankin he, shut up he wants mankin to fuck him slightly different <laughs> right than, like, but yeah on. he's very deep in the atm stuff that's his baby and she insulted his baby especially the whole mankin campaign they're writing on Roman's ideas that he pitched and his dad actually told him he did a good job on. Uh, so this was a huge insult for him. Right, like one of the last real moments of affirmation from Logan was during episode uh, six of last season after that weekend in Virginia when Logan said he did a good job this weekend, son, put his hand on his shoulder. Even the stuff in Italy, I mean, Roman fucked that up pretty quickly with the dick pic thing, so he didn't really get to bask in the glory of that approval. So I think it would make sense if he's kind of clinging to this ATN and Mankin thing as, like, this is the last thing that my dad was proud of me for doing. Yeah, he wants to finish his dad's lunch. The scene with Jerry was great. I loved this scene. Roman and Jerry was always an unhealthy relationship, as we did discuss last season. Uh, but it was more subtle, and I think a lot of people did not pick up on it. But I'm really enjoying just the clusterfuck that it's become now. It's very clear how how emotionally invested they both are. I mean, there's a moment when you can see Jerry's lip, like, kind of trembling. I mean, she is really emotionally impacted by this conversation, by Roman telling her you're not good at your job. I mean... It's not like she's just going to brush this off and be like, whatever, he's a brat, you know? <laughs> this means as much to her, I think, as it does to him. And this was just a gut-wrenching scene. Yeah, she's so quiet and angry when she says, I'm good at my job. This is a huge blow. And she did not anticipate it all, clearly. She thought they were still kind of in the relationship where, oh, he's taking my advice. He's not his dad. You know, it always goes back to Logan. I mean, the last thing that Logan asked Roman to do was to fire Jerry. And Roman has clearly been in Jerry's corner for a long time, has always been the one saying, let's not fire her for receiving pictures of my dick. Let's not take out a senior woman mm -hmm. for cruises, you know? He has often been very defensive of her and, and obviously does think that she's good at her job. But it's just this way that he's channeling Logan here and feeling like, um, I don't know, like this is, I mean, he, he's becoming Logan a little bit, the Loganification of Roman Roy. A little bit. And he sets himself up in both the scenes with Joy and Jerry. He kind of says, oh, I could fire you. And then, as he said, he kind of has to do it. He feels like he has to do it just to prove he actually has the power and isn't just saying that. Uh, I liked what uh, J. Smith Cameron said on the official pod about how he's almost just on this killing spree where, you know, once he starts, it's like, I can't stop. And it read as sort of like a self-harm kind of thing too, especially at the end where he knows, I mean, he knows that he fucked up. He goes uh, to Kendall right after he fires Jerry, like literally right after. He does not even stop walking yep. for a second. And he's like, hey, can you undo that for me? And then at the end, he's listening to this like berating video message and listening to it over and over and over again in a way to connect with his dad and this is you know this is a new thing that he can hear his dad say which is something that he can't you know get access to but also like to quote sharp objects to a child weaned on poison harm is a comfort damn damn right i think that quote gets used a lot in like tumblr photo sets and stuff for any yeah. abusive fictional relationship and it works really well sharp objects is, yeah it's good roman was definitely doing something here um he said 
in the scene with Jerry, I need you to believe that I am as good as my dad. Logan, you know, like, the fairies in Peter Pan have, they need belief in order to exist and fly around. That's Logan. That's my argument. That was a very, like, Jeremy Strong quote of you. <laughs> and I'm right, though. That is Logan. Yeah. People believe in him and build up this mythology around him, and that gave him power. And Roman definitely understands that and is trying to build the same thing for himself. Like, the two things you really need to be Logan are, A, you need to believe it, like, act like it, and you need the people around you to believe it, too, and agree with what you decide, back it up, support it. He's not getting that. And I think he took some huge steps in this episode toward getting that. He's clearly not at the place Logan was at yet where he doesn't feel bad about himself at the end of the day. So of course, I think Logan did feel kind of bad at the end of the day and needed that one woman in his life to make him tea and make him feel, I did right. I did good, right? Yeah, to tell him, no, your kids are treacherous little leeches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the okay. good guy here. It's just everyone else. They're bad and that's, they're trying to make you feel bad, but don't let them get to you, baby. Kendall was yeah. not in the right place to give him a wake-up call in this episode. He's he's in hype mode. Like, you could see initially, he was like, oh, you you fired Jerry, Shiv's godmother, Jerry. But then he immediately, like, tries to turn it positive. Like, no, this is great. We're making change here, brother. Right. I mean, Kendall cannot be taken down from this high here. Yeah, neither of them are really being good partners to each other. Um, in the after show, Jesse Armstrong said... Um, it's too early to tell whether this Roman strategy of being super, you know, aggressive and firing people left and right will work, which um, I think is good to keep in mind because when you think about Logan, I mean, people always want to compare them and, you know, jump right to being like, oh, they're not, they're not serious people. Logan was right. By people, you mean Kara Swisher. I'm just begging Kara Swisher again. God damn it. We have also seen Logan act very impulsively. We have seen him fire people without consulting anyone like he did after the vote of no confidence when he fired half the board, which Frank said, oh, that's not a great move to do. And he said, fuck, you don't care. You're fired. Fired, fired, fired. Didn't consult anyone. It is just a difference of, you know, Logan kind of gets to do that because everyone else just lets him do it, basically, where his Roman, you know, he doesn't really have that mojo to back it up. So he can't, he can't really get away with it as of yet. I mean, we'll see, I guess. But I think, especially with Jerry, just because Jerry knows him so well, I mean, for Roman to go in and be like, you need to respect me was a little Roman. You, you sent her so many pictures of your dick, Roman. <laughs> Come on, boy. That was less than a year ago. She knows a lot about you. <laughs> like, just tread a little lightly there. That's a great comparison to which side are you on. And it does remain to be seen because this is his first week and he fired two women specifically. Like, I think Roman should try to fire at least one guy just so it looks a little less bad. Just even it out a little. Look less sexist. <laughs> Unless that's what he's going for. Trying to build up his rep. Oh god, Roman. Yeah, listening to to his dad's voice berating him over and over at the end. Are we going to talk about it? Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Because you know what? We will talk about anything on this podcast. So the major discourse to come out of this episode is, um, which is really a, ver a very specific succession discourse, is was Roman sexually aroused by listening to a deep fake of his dead father humiliating him on repeat in the back of a car? Some people are saying yes. Some people thought he was actively jerking off in that scene, which I do not think is true. I mean, um, I think we would be able to tell. If they wanted to do that, they would have showed it, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, they're not um, that subtle of a show. They're not shy about that kind of stuff. Some people say, no, that's gross. And I say, why draw the line there, guys? <laughs> Come on. We are already in this together. <laughs> yeah, after the Roman Jerry sex scenes that we've gotten. I don't even think it's necessarily all that different, because a lot, like, a lot of what Jerry said to him was... Uh, specifically about what his family and his father thought about him, saying, what would your family think if they saw you? And he says, I don't care. And she says, oh, but you do care. That was really at the heart of it, was like berating him because 
he's a fuck up in his dad's eyes. That's what he was getting off on, okay? It's a consistent thread on the show, and I, when I was watching this scene for the first time, I was wondering, is he about to jerk off here? Right, I thought that too, okay? Yeah. Honesty space. He was doing something with his, like, upper lip twitching that yeah. was similar to the way he's played other scenes where he is aroused. It's there. It's not... It doesn't mean we're being disrespectful to... The memory of Logan Roy. <laughs> yeah, like, there's just a lot of emotions happening there. and it's... Yeah, it, it, was, it was not the predominant emotion, but it was in the mix. Yeah. Weird things happen when you're grieving. Roman's got some wires crossed, all right? Yeah. And I know we've talked about this before, that it seems very likely that he was sexually abused as a child, probably by someone close to the family, which could definitely have an impact on his whole thing. So I, I uh, think that the people that are saying, oh, you guys are so gross for thinking that. Oh, come on. Get grosser. Succession is a very vanilla fandom. Be, be freaks. Be freaks like Shiv and Tom. Come on. That's a pretty low bar. I know, I know, but we'll talk about it. Maybe let's talk about Shiv and Tom then. <laughs> Are you... We're just going to jump around like the outline today. We're... You're, you're saving Kendall for the We'll end. get it. I'm just in the flow. I'm in the flow. Okay. All right. So Shiv and Tom, big episode for them. So it starts when Tom like walks into Shiv's private scheduled grief time and they talk a little bit. And then they kiss, and I cheered when they kissed, Savannah. You were valid for that. I love that she scheduled grief time for herself. Uh, this was so essential, and she's seemingly the only character who's like, hey, I'm not doing well here. I actually need to m- take time out of my day to grieve. Everyone else is like, oh, I'm doing fine. And I think that is also kind of shows being a woman, like, if Shiv had made the kind of outburst that Roman made at the end of the last episode, he would be labeled emotional and not taken seriously at all. So, I mean, he kind of is, but to a worse degree. It would be it would be worse if it was Shiv. Yeah. She's already yeah, barely gotten any ground here, um, so it's very makes sense that Shiv is the only character who's like, yeah, I know how to keep my emotions in all the time, and I'm gonna set some time aside for when I'm alone to let them out. Yeah, that actually is pretty healthy of her to just recognize that that's something that she needs to do. So later on at the party, they play Bitey as foreplay. So this was the hottest scene ever in Succession, in my opinion. (laughs) Who says Succession doesn't do sex scenes? This was better than the one actual sex scene that we got, which was Kendall eating out raw. This was better. I loved that uh, Lorene Scafaria, the director, said that it was electrifying to watch on set. Oh, I bet it was. They were just in the middle of a party and they started doing this. That's so crazy. Everyone else is like, hey, aren't they getting divorced? (laughs) This was so childlike of them. Again, um, they can't actually say what they want. They're just like, hey, do you want to play bitey? You want to try to bite my arm? And that mutual, like, let's hurt each other and see how long one of us can take it before we have to stop. Yeah. Ah, It's this the perfect metaphor for their relationship. It's perfect. I love when, I forget which interview it was, but they mentioned that, I think, Lucy Preble. This was like a game she played with her brother growing up. I think you can kind of tell when the writers work details from their own lives into the show. Because it always seems so organic and like something that someone somewhere has thought of. It would be really cute if this was something that Shiv did with, like, Roman or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's how I'm, that's how I'm choosing I, to interpret it. I love it. that. I accept that headcanon. Yeah, good scene. And the fact that Tom is the one that ultimately wins is a nice, uh, nice touch there. Yeah, it's fitting. And it kind of makes her more interested in him. Yeah, for sure. Tom Wamsgans made me feel something. That was such a transparent lie, but I don't blame her. Really. Right. Especially with the way he started this scene. I'm sorry for fucking you up. That's a classic (laughs) bullshit apology. I'm sorry you were so hurt. I think that Shiv kind of clinging to those defenses of saying like, oh, you barely scratched the surface was so clearly and purposefully transparent. You know, I, I think it's very different from the ways that she might previously like truly act as if she doesn't care about Tom. You know, I think it yeah. was easier to see through than maybe how she had treated him in the past that was 
easier for him to see as like, oh, you actually don't care about me. Yeah, I think there was a long time where Tom thought Tib does not love me. And I think he sees it now. There was a good uh, Tumblr post <laughs> that was <laughs> What's that? that was basically like, if only Tom had treated Shiv the way he treats Greg and treated Greg the way he sh- treats Shiv, he could have had them both eating out of the palm of his hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Particularly for Shiv. I mean, the way that he is with Greg, where he's sort of physically aggressive with him, he pushes him around, he's meaner to him, he kind of fronts like he doesn't care as much. Um, I mean, he's doing that to Shiv now, and she just keeps getting drawn closer into him. Yeah, she's super into it. We didn't actually see them having sex that often when they were a married couple before. Now that they're separated and he's being mean to her, she's super <laughs> down. Divorce win! They're so bad at marriage and they're so bad at divorce. I love them. I am all in on Tom Shiv. I hope they never break up. I don't think they'll ever permanently break up. I think they'll go back and forth. They'll be one of those couples. That's hot, but that poor kid. Oh, man. Well, they still got at least another big fight coming down the road that we saw in the trailer. So looks like that's probably next week. And I wonder when she's going to tell him that she's pregnant. (laughs) At this point, I'm like, she's going to tell someone, right, before the show ends? She's going to tell someone. Okay. She's going to tell someone. I mean, she's got to tell Tom. She has to tell Tom. She'll tell someone. They're just saving it like the Kendall killing someone, sort of. Reveal. Right, just just like holding back on that. Well, and then after they have sex, they, um, they have a conversation where Tom is pretty honest about his drive for money and wealth and how much he enjoys um, that like aspect of his life and that he's not willing to give that up for anyone um, and that he has felt caught between Shiv and Logan. Whether we think that Tom pursued Shiv in an attempt to further his career, I think is a headcanon that makes sense. But then I think once he was maybe with Shiv, it was clear that... um, she was very willing to keep him at a lower level. I mean, especially during season two when he was always like, what are you going to get for me? What are you going to get for me? And she was like, well, I got myself CEO. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Flop. Yeah, Tom was really honest in this scene. This was maybe my favorite scene of the episode. Um, I just really was not expecting this for them to address the money thing so explicitly. I think... Fans often make the mistake of making it one or the other. Either, no, they're just totally in this for the love. Or, no, it's a pure money thing. Tom doesn't love Shiv or Shiv doesn't love Tom. Um, It's both. There's a lot of reasons that people go into relationships. Like, you can genuinely like someone and it's also that they really suit your lifestyle. I don't think Shiv would want Tom if he wasn't this. Um, But she looked disgusted to hear him talk about it um, which was really interesting and definitely very hypocritical I'm glad he called her out on it at the end like she doesn't have to think about money at all there's always been such a surplus of it Tom is someone who probably comes from an upper class background uh, but we've seen on this show that there's a huge difference between being rich and being rich rich should we go into the presentation then Oh, you want to talk about Kendall now? The minor character of the episode, Kendall? Are you accusing me of skipping over Kendall? You literally did. Well, we were jumping around. We started talking about Roman. So I was like, well, we might as well just do our Roman bullet point. And then we started talking about Shiv and Tom. I say we, I mean me. I'm just saying. Okay, let's fucking talk about Kendall. God damn it. Thank you. Okay, so Kendall, uh, the one of the main characters of the show. One of one of um (laughs) okay so he is on his own for this pitch um and also the scene right before he goes out on stage where he's confronted about the numbers by carl was definitely one of my favorites of this episode carl unleashed this was maybe carl's best scene of the series and kendall actually sort of listens to him he steers away from the numbers and uh, gives a shout out to Carl, which was smart. Um, yeah. 
he may be spinning out, but he did actually take senior leadership advice instead of just firing someone, which is more than can be said for Roman. The presentation goes, I guess, about as well as it could. It was maybe off to a rocky start, a little touch and go, but ultimately a success. And it's just interesting the way he planned it, because obviously he was always planning to have Logan's voice be the one to deliver these, you know, doctored numbers, which I think it's so interesting. That makes all the change, right? Yeah. Like Carl was really mad about the numbers until it came out of Logan's mouth. Then it's like, oh, great. Good job, kid. That was very smart of Kendall, I think, because what are they going to do if it's Logan? You can't indict a dead guy. Using Logan also uh, creates a pretty effective, like, emotional appeal that was both, like, staged and sincere when he has this moment where he gets, you know, choked up and says that another year with his dad would have been priceless. I mean, I think that was a really effective moment. It's really effective and one of the few emotionally effective moments Kendall has had. Like, often when he goes up and does these things, he's just very fake and people can tell, but Kendall absolutely meant what he said about his dad here and that's why it worked. The real like W for Kendall begins when uh, Matson tweets um, a concentration camp joke about Doderick. I hated this. Like just a slight sidebar as hor- horrific as Living Plus is, this was a horrible comparison to make. The response was definitely as good as it could have been. The tweet did not make Matson look good at all. And he also deleted it very quickly, so... Always an embarrassing move. I was afraid when Kendall got this question that he was going to launch into his uh, Madsen is a madman thing. So super proud of him for how he responded. He was very professional and quickly pivoted the conversation back to Living Plus and what it has to offer, which was great. Yeah, I think he did a good job. It shows Kendall's you know, strengths uh, to be able to kind of think on his feet like that and keep his feelings and his agenda like under wraps, but still kind of push it forward by, you know, saying that he's not maybe a fan of Matson personally, but still, uh, you know, staying professional. And then after the presentation, everyone's just congratulating Kendall, even though like five minutes ago, they were all saying how cringe he was. Uh, which is just funny that the response from everyone else, um, you know, really changes how they feel about the whole presentation. And the fact that, I mean, through most of it, everyone was like, wow, what a fucking loser. And then he kind of brings it home at the end and everyone's cheering him on. A lot of these people, Greg, Broman, were also involved in, you know, what ended up on that stage. Um, they knew it was going to happen, but they all abandoned him and were like, well, my face isn't going to be up there. And then they sat there and talked about how bad it was when it was actually doing great. We see these characters at their most vulnerable. We know that Kendall is actually a mess right now and not doing well. And because we've seen so much of them, we can see the little cracks when they're in public. But the rest of the public is not seeing that. Like, they're getting 10% of this and they actually look like they're doing fine. That's a good point. You know, he walks out on stage, he kind of, you know, keeps it together, (laughs) thinks well on his feet. Everyone's like, all right, he's cool. The point of the show is not that the kids are always going to lose. It's that even when they win, they lose. I think that was something that was on the board of, of the writer's room in season one. They said Kendall wins, but he loses. Again, Kendall wins, but he loses. He did a great job here. Um, But at the end of the episode, he was still alone and in the water, which is never a good sign. And he wrote in the sand with his foot number one. I know. Are you fucking joking? (laughs) He's such a loser. Didn't forget that one, huh, Ken? We really saw his sort of like addictive personality here. I mean, he's... He's sober. He's been sober all season. He's been slamming LaCroix, which is a classic sober move. (laughs) If a friend of yours is slamming LaCroix, ask him if they're okay. But, um, you know, when he's not using drugs, he definitely uses other things to kind of fill that. And he's somewhat aware of it. In the premiere of this season, he said, you know, I need something super absorbing right now because unfortunately I know that heroin is cool and awesome. (laughs) Can get demonetized for that one. Heroin is not cool or awesome. 
Yeah, don't do heroin, guys. He needs to strive for something. He needs to take risks. And yeah, this just kind of hits all those buttons for him. Yeah, Waystar in particular hits those buttons in a way that not a lot of things do. It's business. It's his dad's business. He's just going to keep striving until he burns himself out, and then he'll find something new. Let's wrap up with our little segments. Um, Let's do burn of the week. (laughs) That's not a good retort. Don't fucking laugh at that. My burn of the week was when Roman said about the city of Los Angeles, it's an incredibly evolved, ruthlessly segregated city you built on this geological fault here. Yeah. Get (laughs) him. We love that New York elitism. What was your burn of the week? So mine was an exchange. Uh, Roman says, I just didn't see it coming with dad. Kendall says, it's very undad. And Roman agrees, very undad. That was a very cute line. It was very undad and him to die. Kind of a weak moment for Logan. Uh, I don't want them to know that Logan died fishing his phone out of the toilet because Roman doesn't need to live with that. But I also really want them to know because it's fucking hilarious and really humanizes him. They still can't quite see him as someone who would die. Let's do Candy Baby. Ugh. Hot. Ugh. My Candy Baby for this episode was Tom. Nice. I've been having a hard time with Tom this season. Um, As we've discussed previously, behavior plays a huge role in Candy Baby. But the way he met Shiv's barbs in this episode was very attractive. His money speech really did it for me. Tom said it. No one talks about money in this show ever, but Tom did it with total confidence, unafraid to make Shiv uncomfortable, and I think we were all a little turned on in that scene. He was looking hot in his polo shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I keep picking the guys in polo shirts. (laughs) Yeah, you're like discovering something about yourself. That's good. That's the point of Candy Baby. It really is. That's the point of this entire podcast. (laughs) Self-discovery. My Candy Baby. Well, okay, so we both picked Shiv last week, but I I do just want to say... Shiv was looking fine this entire episode. She was. Great hair, great outfits, very hot. Honorary mention yeah. to Shiv. Honorary mention to Shiv. If we both hadn't just picked her, I definitely would have picked Shiv here. But uh, I did not pick Shiv. I picked, and this is humiliating for me, and I'll explain why, Lucas Matson. <laughs> I know why this is humiliating for you. It's humiliating for me because I am always on my high horse about blonde people and scandies um all right so here's the thing i know that alexander skarsgård is like an objectively attractive man but he's never done it for me in this role until the scene of him on the plane with shiv i was like oh no he's hot it's uh the bare feet it's the sunglasses it's the way he's really been turning on the charm with shiv In general, I'd say that expressiveness is a very attractive quality to me. I love a hyperactive little clown, and he was definitely doing more with his face and voice than he usually does. So yeah, I I got Matson pilled, and I can't wait for the Tom Shiv Lucas three-way scene next episode. Let's go! I love that for you. I love how you're owning this. I think a conventionally attractive man is hot. It's humiliating. He's just such a basic man, you know? I know, I know. It's embarrassing. I know. We've we've been over You're it. You're the one who brought it up. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Classic. Wait, do you think Bill is attracted to Bill Skarsgård? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, that wasn't, I agree. I mean, it depends. Like, what's he doing? <laughs> I feel like I'm such a, like, uh, just, like, personality girl. I'm like, well, what is he doing? <laughs> Um, Describe to me a behavior that Bill Skarsgård could be doing, and then I'll tell you whether he's hot. I mean, this is very non-shallow of you. Whatever. Yeah, he's fine. He's he's cute. He was cute in that one movie. Uh, I just said the name. Well, what'd you say? Barbarian. Barbarian. He was cute in Barbarian. Yeah. 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 yeah That's sure. the only other movie I've seen him in. Besides it, <laughs> as Pennywise. <laughs> Not hot as Pennywise. <laughs> no, not hot as Pennywise. I will Pennywise. go out on a limb and say, not into that. I'm not into literal clowns. <laughs> if he acted differently, he might be if into he acted differently. It's not about his physical attractiveness. It's about it a little bit. I, I don't believe you. I believe there's a version of Pennywise that you would be attracted to. <laughs> oh, you're probably right. God damn it. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough out here for... Me. (laughs) 
Ooh, okay. Let's do bus line. Words are just, uh, what? Nothing. Complicated airflow. My best line was when Roman said, There's gotta be ways through. Death just feels very one-size-fits-all. Mortality as the ultimate playing field leveler has been central to succession from its pilot episode, and it's of course come back to the forefront this season following Logan's death. Roman has always been the most in denial about his father's mortality, and he even says in this scene that he didn't see it coming. The desire that powerful people have to escape their own mortality through technology is both despicable but kind of understandable. It's really the one thing you have in common with everyone on Earth. You haven't yet died, but one day you are going to. And we can connect on that. The fear, the uncertainty, the vulnerability. It's good that it's one size fits all. But also a lot of the human condition is trying to escape that certainty in one way or another. So I can't really blame people for trying to. For rich and powerful people who are so distanced from the physical realities of being alive, of course death is the last thing to conquer. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. I really like that scene and them sort of talking around their dad's death. They're still kind of awkward with it. So my best line was, come and live with me in a trailer park. I knew we were going to talk about this monologue elsewhere, but I just have a lot to say about it on this line from Tom. Um, this made me think back to Tom and Shiv's wedding night. Tom tells Shiv he doesn't care about the plan, he married her for her, and that they should move to New Zealand to become sheep farmers. Uh, they laugh about it and reiterate that while love is bullshit, they do love each other. They presented themselves with very pure intentions in that scene, uh, but the thing is they could move to New Zealand. They could walk away from all this. Neither of them wants anything like that, and they both know that. There are things they've become accustomed to that they can get from each other, and that's part of the interest for both of them. Um, in this episode, they say the quiet part out loud. Chib tells them, well, I'd follow you anywhere for, anywhere for love, and they laugh hysterically at that. It's a joke. Love's always been a joke for them. Yeah. It's a joke, but I don't know. It's interesting the way that they play that scene where he at first laughs, and then when she doesn't laugh, he the smile kind of retreats on his face like, oh shit, is she serious? <laughs> and then she laughs and then he laughs again and then it kind of fades again. There's this all of these like they're layers to like... They're with each other like that. They're like, haha, I don't love you. And they're like, but are, are you joking? Do you know I'm joking? Do you think I'm not joking? Like, is there some part of him that wants to believe that she really would? I'm sure. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let's do number one boy. You're my boy. You're my number one boy. My number one boy for this episode was actually Kendall. Surprise, surprise! Look, Kendall didn't write the number one in the sand for me not to pick him as my number one boy. He was Pete Kendall this episode, from getting matching jackets for him and his brother to wear, to talking to a giant recording of his dead father that he manipulated, um, and he pulled it off. He, no one believed in him. Not his family, not the old guard, not Kara Swisher, but he delivered a genuinely compelling presentation for the investors and only said, like, two things that he could potentially get indicted for. That's huge. <laughs> Absolutely none of this is going to make him happy, but my boy did a good job, and I'm putting his progress report up on the fridge. That's great. Um, my number one boy was Carl. No, I'm kidding. It's Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> it's also Kendall. All right. What does he have to do for you to pick him again? I'm not that withholding. I'm not Logan. Um, yeah, Kendall. This was a good episode for him. Um, I think that Kendall's like addictive personality is one of the traits that I relate to him on. So I liked seeing him both being sober, but also still being a little bit unhinged. And... It was a fun reversal of expectations to see him actually score a W here and <laughs> go Kendall. Uh, no one expected it, either in universe or in the audience, I think. And the, the particular way he got this win, I think, shows that he has his head on straighter than we may have thought, you know? He knew that his, like, made-up numbers, if he just said them, that he would be laughed out of the room, that Carl would squeal, etc. He had already pre-planned for that even before Carl threatened him in the hallway, right? He was going to put those words into Logan's mouth, which, um, I mean, he, 
he understands, I think, the position that he's in. And he is playing it the best that he can. And it's this interesting thing of him both using his dad that could be interpreted out of spite, you know, like, I'm going to make you do something for me now. Just a good move. I liked, yeah, I liked this from him. I don't know what compelled him to send that video to Roman, but that was funny, okay? It was funny. I don't think Kendall was in the wrong for that. That was a cute brotherly move, I thought. It was a cute brotherly thing, but <laughs> come on, man. Maybe not the best for him. I loved what uh, Lorene Scafaria said about the final shots of this episode, that Kendall is floating face up in water. Kendall beat the water motif. <laughs> Take that water. Yeah. He beat water. <laughs> he beat water. That's something Kendall himself would brag about. I defeated water. He defeated the metaphorical concept of water. He was actually being very smart in this episode. He dropped the whole house thing that he, he knew was too much. He did know what he was doing at the end of the day. And like, CEOs are like this. People are being so hard on the kids. But... They are depicting what actual CEOs are like. They do crazy shit like this, but they do have some business smarts, usually. I mean, it's it's a scale, but Kendall does have some business smarts. And the fact that the numbers are bullshit is kind of like, so what? I mean, like, Lo like Logan in the very first episode was talking about how you can make reality, how you don't really need to be dependent on on things like trends and the market and all that. So I mean, Kendall really, if we're gonna if we're gonna use Logan as a benchmark for good business sense, which I have some things to say about that, but if that is the benchmark we are using, he is definitely reaching that as far as like, I am going to say something and then it will become reality. The stock price shoots up because I say it will, basically. Yeah, if you make the product sound like it's gonna be really successful, that's gonna get people excited about it and make it more successful. And especially if you have a dead guy saying these numbers, like, who cares if they don't end up being real? It's like, it's not necessarily on, on his back unless that, like, editor squeals or, or Greg squeals, but you could kill both those people. No one's going to care. <laughs> Kendall's already a murderer. What's two more? Kill Greg. Kill Greg. Oh, wait. One, one more thing I want to say. Just a small, small thing that I loved was when, uh, when they were all celebrating Kendall. Roman's leaving the room. He's in a bad mood. He like bumps his shoulder into Shiv harder than is friendly, I think, and then goes up to Kendall and starts like whacking him on the back in a congratulatory but very aggressive manner. Kendall does not react at all. It's just so funny. It's like Roman is literally just hitting him. Kendall's just like, yeah, man, it's like walking on the moon, you know? Kendall's on cloud nine. He's like, I hardly even remember it already. Oh my god. Amazing scene. Roman just leaves the room in a tizzy and Kendall has no idea. So, yeah. Roman Ooh. is very sexually frustrated. Like, he has too much physical aggression, you know? The kind that could be exercised If he got laid? Side. Bye. <laughs> Honestly, the, the Roman Bacon stuff, I think, is gonna go crazy when it happens. Like, I know we've been talking about this every episode. But... This is our Super Bowl. <laughs> Look, if I am going to get queer baited by succession, it is going to be for Roman and Mankin. Like, I've just made my bed and I'm laying in it. They're gonna fuck on screen. <laughs> I don't actually want an explicit sex scene on the show, but it would be so funny if the only one we got was Roman and Nick. Come on, commit. Kieran Culkin w wants to win that Emmy. He's hitting the pavement. He is out there. Yeah. He's on Hot Ones. He is working his little tail off. And a gay sex scene. Come on. I can't believe he didn't go for a tail joke. He brought the tail thing and then gay sex. He didn't. I know how he could work his tail off. <laughs> there, there you go. We got it. We got there. <laughs> Woo. All right. We always get to about like 80 minutes for our raw runtime and we are getting there. So I think that's, I think that means that it is about time for us to wrap. What a fun episode to talk about. I know this episode got a little bit of a lukewarm response from some people. Uh... We just talked about it very positively for an hour, so I think you can tell how we felt about it. Uh, I liked it. Yeah, I think there are definitely episodes in this season that I felt more strongly about, but overall, I would not say there are any duds this season. Definitely plenty to discuss. I think this episode had a lot of really strong scenes, 
Um, even if maybe as an episode it felt a little like, why are we spending time on this new product launch or whatever? Yeah. I think this, like the good scenes and the good character stuff within it justified it, I believe. And I just like the living plus as a concept. I think it's very, very thematically apt for succession. I think that was the thing about the episode is we're in the final season, the second half. Why are we still spending time on the deal, whether or not it's going to happen, and on this product launch and stuff that obviously isn't that central to the show? I can see, as I can see, why people were not super into it. And I will admit, again, going into the episode, I was not super excited about this one. Um, But I agree that the character development and character actions that we got out of it really made it feel worthwhile. I think we are building up to a fairly explosive last few episodes here. We also got episode titles for the rest of the season today, I think. So we got Tailgate Party next week, which I think is the the night before the election, I believe. It seems that's just from context clues. I'm assuming it's the night before and not the night of. Um, And then America decides... Election day, most likely we get Roman at the riot. Roman versus Antifa. I want Roman fans to experience a similar shakeup to what Kettle fans got, where we weed out the fake ones and only strong survive. I will survive. I will come to the pod and I will defend whatever bullshit Roman pulled in that episode. I believe in you. Thank you. And then episode nine is uh, Church and State, Mm -hmm. which I think is rumored to be... uh, Logan's funeral. And then the finale, with open eyes, we come back to our dream song 29. I don't think this is a title that anyone predicted, like other lines that people were pulling out to maybe be chosen. This was not one I saw a lot, but I love it. We were both kind of team uh, where they may be found. Yes, that was my top pick. That's a little more ominous. We haven't seen the episode and with what they've written so far, I can see how with open eyes would fit better. Last three written by Jesse Armstrong, our boy. Last two directed by Mark Mylod. Yeah. Let's fucking cook, guys. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this week. If you enjoy the podcast, you can hit like on this video. You can support us on Kofi. I'm going to keep saying it that way. I know you are. You don't. Coffee. The link is below. You can give us a few dollars. And we would appreciate that. I'm officially in my unemployment era. Day one of unemployment. It's going great. What did you do today, Jenny? Actually, I had to do one thing for my job that ended on Friday. So I did my one thing that I promised someone I would do today. And then I I had to. I also had to drop something off for the group home job. So I had to go run an errand for that. You're really bad at unemployment. I'm bad at unemployment. I did two job related things on my first day of unemployment. Um, And you turned this into a job. And then I turned the podcast into a job. So I did three job related things. Um, I did a lot of podcast prep. I watched the episode twice. I listened to um, the watch and the official pod, which are my two that I always listen to before we record. Same. Um, Yep. Chris and Andy are friends. They don't know us, yes, I, but they're our friends. They become our friends. They yeah, we we stole a, our, our kind of segment structure from them originally. Yeah, well, they stopped doing it, and it was, a, they, yeah. it was a great idea. That's it. We'll wrap up there, and we'll see you next week for Tailgate Party. I am really excited for this episode at this point. It looks like a really fun one where everyone's kind of stuck in a room together. Yes, I always love that for Succession. Love that vibe. Yeah, well... I'm going to go swim in the ocean uh, because I did a good job today. Be careful of that water motif, man. <laughs> you got to be so careful. I can get you. Well, it's like what Connor and Tom said to Greg about his five million inheritance yeah. is that five will drive you crazy. Then you're just surrounded by, you know, rich, rich people. And you're like, oh, well, how do I get there? It's always someone that's richer than you. Until yep. you're, I guess, literally the richest person. And then you just have to, like, buy Twitter to fill the void, I guess. And we all see how that. And then you're no longer the richest person. So solve that one. <laughs> and you're just the CEO of Twitter who everyone hates. <laughs> he, he bought the, like, roast me machine. It's so crazy. <laughs> Kendall would do that. Yeah, self-loathing Kendall move.